Hello friends, welcome to our study of heaven. Based on the scriptures and this book in front of me by Randy Alcorn, who has exhaustively studied this subject and we are the beneficiaries of his scholarship and wisdom. With God's help. Let us pray. Our God and Savior, thank you for providing us this medium, this way of exchanging our thoughts and prayers, our conclusions, our joys and our sorrows as we approach this topic. Uh, Lord, we need your help today. We need your spirit to guide our study, to guard our thoughts, and to draw us closer to you as we wrap up this particular study. Thank you, God, for your many, many kindnesses to us. We offer ourselves now in service to one another and in service to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we're going to do something new. Uh, we're going to take on three chapters. Um, we have only five left, which makes kind of an awkward mix. So. Um, we're going to take on the three chapters that remain in part two, questions and answers about heaven. And uh, then next time we'll finish up with the entirety of part three, two chapters, uh, which is concerned with, um, with what? Oh, living in the light of heaven. So, would you turn to your materials to page 71? We're going to start with chapter 42, which is part of section 12. Section 12 asks the question, what will we do in heaven? And chapter 42 asks specifically, will there be arts, entertainment, and sports? Well, if you are a football fan like me and anticipating the upcoming football season, you sure hope there will be sports, um, and with perfected bodies, we might actually be good at them. But let's start with music. What do we know for, for certain from Scripture about heaven as it is currently, and also the new heavens and the new earth? Well, Revelation gives us insight into uh, one of the things that goes on in heaven, and that is worship of God. So let's look at chapter 4 and verse 8 of Revelation. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Now, the verse there specifically says saying, um, and other, on other occasions it says shouting, but maybe in your Bible as is mine, the text is set apart in such a way to make it look like poetry. And um, while reading a poem is not the same thing as singing a song, there certainly are similarities. So... If that isn't enough to convince you, just go down a few lines to verse 11. And here, uh, the 24 elders uh, say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they are created and have their being. Again, that's saying. Um, but go on then to chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. And the uh, saints, let's see, the, 20, uh, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one was holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they, meaning the four living creatures and the 24 elders, sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain 
And with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and nation and people and language. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Uh, skip down to verse 12. In a loud voice they sang, uh, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Verse 13, And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and the Lamb be praise and honor, glory and power forever and ever. So in chapter 5 uh, we have some very specific examples that say singing and allude to singing. Uh, then in chapter 15 verses 3 and 4 uh, we have um, the heavenly creatures uh, singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. So, on page 71, all of these are examples of singing in heaven. Um, who is singing in chapter 14? The 144,000 are. What do they have to sing about? They have been redeemed is the answer in verses 3 and 4. So that's a lot to sing about. Salvation is something worth singing. Uh, then as we proceed in this section, I think my margins got a little goofed up. In the new creation, music will serve its ultimate purpose, which is to glorify God. Um, that is the ultimate purpose of music. Now, there are lots of other purposes that in this world we put music to. We, we use music for the purpose of uh, expressing our emotions. We use music to entertain. When we sing together, we use music to fellowship. And there are other worldly purposes to music, too. Um, last week had occasion to go to a concert um, in downtown Sioux Falls, and, and while I enjoyed the concert a great deal, um, there was nothing in the music that was particularly glorifying to God. So music gives us joy and has lots of purposes, but its ultimate purpose, its most sanctified use, is worship and glorifying God. How will the, this use of music benefit the righteous who live in the Father's kingdom? Um, I think in the new heaven and new earth, um, music will be used to glorify God and it will benefit us in the same way that worship glorifies us in this life. When we worship together, we direct our attention to God, we take it away from self, and um, it gives us uh, an opportunity to be together in fellowship, it causes enthusiasm, it gives us an expression or a means of uh, showing our gratitude to God, and um, just causes uh, enthusiasm, kind of binds us together. Um, so, we can say with certainty, I mean very high degree of certainty, there will be music in heaven. Music is an art. It is a form of entertainment. Not a sport per se, but certainly uh, fulfills those other two qualifications. Um, next, we say there may be dancing in heaven. Um, the only passage that I could find, or that Elkhorn could find, 
that kind of well, fit that bill was, uh, or is, Jeremiah chapter 31, 4 and 5. Now, Jeremiah 31 is, uh, in context, a declaration of the new covenant. Now, we know that when Jesus came along, he said that his blood was the new covenant. So that phrase doesn't automatically point to the new heaven and the new earth. But um, when you read Jeremiah 31, it, it has a, a very utopian sound to it. And it, it could be argued, I think, in, in all of its particulars, there is no moment in history that precisely fulfills what is promised here in um, Jeremiah 31. So, we're going to maybe extend this a little bit. Um, verses 4 and 5 promise this. I will build you up again, and you will be rebuilt, O virgin Israel. Again, you will take up your tambourines and go out to dance with the joyful. Now, we really could quit there. Verse 5 says... Again, you will plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria. The farmers will plant them and enjoy their fruit. But certainly Jeremiah 3, 31, 4 makes a specific reference to dancing. Why do we dance? Well, it's a form of praise to the Lord. Um, certainly worldly forms of dance are not. Uh, and some can be um, promoting sin. But... And inasmuch as um, dance is directed as a means of praise, as it certainly is in the Bible, starting in Exodus when Miriam danced before the Lord, uh, uh, it, it can be, uh, I think, logically and reasonably assumed that there will be dancing in heaven. If you're a person who enjoys dancing, you will no doubt find that to be good news. And... It certainly makes sense that where there is music, dancing will follow. Third part of this chapter is there will be, I should say, I think I say, I think we can say will be storytelling in heaven. And given what we've already studied about heaven, I think this will be logical. What will we tell stories about? Will they be fiction or non-fiction? And um, I think like music and like dancing, the stories will center on God. That's one thing we need to remember about the Bible in general. God is the hero of every story. Even in Esther, where the name God is not mentioned a single time, God is, is, it is implied that God is the hero of that story, that he worked things out for the benefit of his people. Um, what, will we what, what will we tell stories about? God. Um, and also, I think, the adventures that we will have in the new heaven and the new earth. And this is something that I'm indebted to Alcorn for, is this sense of adventure in the new heaven and the new earth, that... that um, it's uh, an exciting, dynamic place and time that we are going to continue to grow. Um, and uh, heaven is not a place uh, where challenge is removed, but instead we have an unlimited opportunity to overcome challenges and have that same kind of satisfaction that we have in this life. In fact, here's what he says. On page 422, we can look forward to endless adventures, encounters, profound sayings, and delightful experiences with Jesus. When, we tell, when he tells a story, we'll all be on the edge of our seats. On the new earth, our resurrected eyes and ears will see and hear God's glory as never before, and our resurrected hearts will be moved to see his beauty everywhere. 
We will live in a land of fascinating observations, captivating insights, wondrous adventures, and spellbinding stories. Uh, that encourages me. I hope it encourages you to know that we're going to have plenty to talk about in heaven. Um, Next section, there may be laughter in heaven. I think, again, I, I could have written that a little more assertively and said there will be laughter in heaven. Um, here's a quotation from a famous person. If you're not allowed to laugh in heaven, I don't want to go there. Now, you might attribute that quote to Mark Twain or Will Rogers or some comedian who, uh, whose whole life revolved around laughter, but actually... The person who said that is the great reformer, Martin Luther. So Martin Luther said himself, if there, if there isn't any laughter in heaven, he wants no part of it. Now that's obviously uh, not great theology, but he is saying uh, to him, about himself that uh, he believes strongly that there will be laughter in heaven. We're going to take a quick look at Luke chapter 6. Uh, Verse 21, we'll look at this passage in more detail in the next chapter. But for now, let's note just one aspect of this. Luke chapter 6 and verse 21. Blessed are you, this is actually the second half of the verse. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. And that's part of that whole section. As I said, we'll take a look at it in just a moment here. There uh, is promised here laughter for those who weep now. And what we'll see in a few moments is that this entire passage, this section here, is devoted to heaven. Jesus is making promises about heaven as it pertains uh, to life in this world. Final question or, or statement. There may be play of all kinds, including sports and all sorts of recreation in heaven. You know, I'm of the mind if we can't play games in heaven, then hmm, I like Luther. It may not be a place I want to go to then. Um, what scriptural evidence can we offer here? Well, not much. Paul, in his letters, twice referred to athletic events or sports as a metaphor of the Christian life. Now that is no, in no way Paul endorsing all sports or saying that sports are always a, a godly thing, always a good thing. Um, but here we have the, um, we're in the place where we can say that there's, there's no direct scriptural accounts that, that say uh, you, you, you won't be playing games in heaven. You won't be in, uh, playing sports. You won't be doing uh, various kinds of amusements. But what it, we have learned uh, very repeatedly in this study is that heaven is a perfected form of things on this earth. And I can only liken it to my experience several years ago. I, I got involved with a group of guys and um, we um, played games together on a, uh, every other week or once a month basis. And when I first got together with that group of guys, um, the experience was a little too intense. I was coming home with a headache, and, and although I enjoyed the time, it, it just seemed to take a lot out of me. And, and what God revealed to me was, we, you're just trying too hard to win. And once I stopped being concerned about winning, when I realized that I was there to enjoy the company of these guys, then my focus shifted and I played to win. I didn't give away anything, um, but I didn't come home with a headache. I enjoyed the time more because I wasn't so competitive. And I think heaven will be that way that we'll be able to enjoy these experiences of sports and entertainment uh, without any of the competitive elements. 
people think, well, there won't be any competition in heaven because competition brings out the worst in people. And I would use my experience as, as just a, a little bit of testimony to say, you know, even in this life, that's not necessarily true. Uh, you can enjoy things thoroughly, and I would argue better without being competitive. And um, I, I can't honestly say that once I had that new attitude that I won more frequently or less frequently, but I can say with certainty I enjoyed it a lot more. And uh, so I, I just offer that as, as a, a way of maybe approaching this topic to say, uh, yes, um, there will be uh, arts, certainly, entertainment, probably, sports, probably, in heaven. Let's turn the page to page 72, uh, and now chapter 43. The question is, will our dreams be fulfilled and missed opportunities regained? Now, obviously, we're going to get more into the realm of imagination here than scripture, but keep your place in Luke and turn to Romans. And Paul makes a very important uh, promise, or God makes a promise to us through Paul, I should say, um, verse 18. So Romans 8, 18, jot that reference down, it's not on your lesson. And here's what it says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. And Paul will go on from there to talk about um, the great things that, are, are, that we can expect with the new heaven and the new earth. Now, does that mean, uh, I think the first thing that means, I should say, is that uh, glory is attention paid to God. It is an awareness of God's presence and a grateful, worshipful response. So what he's saying, first and foremost, is whatever we suffer in this body, in this life, it's not worth comparing. It's a sacrifice that we can easily make when we realize the glory of God's presence and what awaits us in heaven. But the other part of that glory of God's presence is joy and satisfaction and the uh, fulfillment of life uh, that is not possible outside of God's presence. So there's a connection there, I think. Um, on page 435 of our text, Alcorn writes, <clears throat> in answer to this question about dreams, certainly some of our dreams are unworthy and they'll be forgotten. So dreams that are self-centered or sinful, um, fantasies of that kind, uh, things that revolve around us, those kinds of things will not exist in heaven. Those kinds of dreams will not be fulfilled in the new heaven and the new earth. But every dream, every hope, every aspiration that comes from God's Spirit, that gives glory to God, obviously that will be fulfilled. Will we get a second chance at missed opportunities? I find that a little harder uh, to justify. But let's go back to Luke 6. And we'll take a look uh, here at this passage in, in the two parts. So here's the context. Jesus went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by evil spirits were cured, and people all tried to touch him, because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, Jesus said, Blessed are you who are poor, 
for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their fathers treated the prophets. So this gives us several examples of God's justice, but the context here is important, and we need to keep that in mind. Um, here, Jesus has been healing, not an individual, but multitudes of people. Healing them from various kinds of illness, from demonic affliction, and it says that Jesus healed them Okay? So this is in a context of healing. It is undoubtedly a joyous moment, a moment of excitement, a moment of great enthusiasm, of awe and wonder at the power of God being displayed in this person, Jesus of Nazareth. So knowing this influences our interpretation of verses 20 to 23, because it's in the context of of great joy. It's also in the context of great justice because who came to Jesus? Not the wealthy or the powerful or the influential, but the people who were down and out, who had exhausted all other hopes, who had come to him to be healed, to be restored. So notice the promises of blessing in these verses. If you hunger now, then you will be satisfied. If you weep now, then you will laugh. If you are hated, excluded, insulted, and rejected because of your association with the Son of Man, you will be blessed. And notice verse 23, because it very specifically tells us when and where these promises will be fulfilled, not in this life. Great is your reward in heaven. So Jesus is pointing ahead to that day when we shall be raised to be with God. Now, verses 24 to 26 give us the other hand. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for that is how their fathers treated the false prophets. So you see how in every detail in these latter three verses, Jesus reverses the view. It's like a mirror image entirely backwards to what you expect. So he says, woe to the rich. They've already received all the comfort they will ever get. Woe to those who are well fed now, for they will go hungry in the life to come. Woe to those who are laughing their heads off in this world because they will mourn and weep in the afterlife. Woe to those who are popular now for that's how they flattered their false prophets. Now I believe that these woes are warnings to unbelievers. Why? Because the promises of, uh, that occurred in the previous verses occurred in heaven. Who is in heaven? Believers. Who's not in heaven? Unbelievers. So these are clearly warnings to unbelievers because believers will only receive rewards in heaven. So are these promises like a dream? 
that will be fulfilled in heaven. In this earth, when we suffer these things, are we to um, be encouraged to think, okay, I'm suffering now, but in eternity, when it really matters, there will be no suffering. I will be redeemed. And I think the obvious answer is yes. Um, let me read to you just a little bit more from Alcorn's book on this subject. Uh, page 433, he writes, um, God promises to make up for the heartbreaks of this earth. So if you wanted to answer, if, if he had posed that question, will God make up for the heartbeats, heartbreaks of this earth, then the answer would definitely be yes. Um, page 434, um, when he's talking about our view of heaven, and we don't want to live in heaven as some kind of creatures in some other world. What we want is to be sinless, healthy people living on earth, but without war, conflict, disease, disappointment, and death. We want to live in the kind of world where our dreams the deepest longings of our hearts really do come true. That is exactly what God's Word promises. So this can sound a bit like wishful thinking, like uh, um, our theology of heaven should be based on what we want to believe, but instead we have this happy um, convergence of, of what God says is true and what we want to believe is true. So at the bottom I quote uh, Alcorn from page 432, eternal life will be forever enjoying what life on earth at its finest moments, what it was intended to be. Now if that were the only thing we would say about heaven, I, I would say we're selling it short because that's very self-centered, whereas uh, heaven is going to be very God-centered. But nonetheless, I think it's a great promise, and it's something that honestly should encourage us in this life. You know, we can endure a lot of things if we know they're going to come to an end. And this life is certainly one of those things. Uh, when it comes to an end, we go to be with the Lord. And we're resting in his eternal presence, safe in his hands. All right, one more. Chapter 44. What will we do in heaven? And Alcorn asks, will we design crafts, technologies, and new modes of travel? Well, this is another of those questions that is very specific. Um, and I, I want to take a step back and look at the big picture here. Uh, create the, the creation itself, what you see out the window behind me, or the flowers that are beside me. Uh, creation itself gives witness to the fact that God is creative. Thousands of varieties of beetles. I find no use for beetles. But God made thousands of different kinds of beetles. That's very creative. He made us to be creative. We misuse that urge in this life, and we can become very creative in our sinning, but nonetheless, uh, given these two facts, it is reasonable to expect that the new creation will be a place of eternal creativity. Let's look at an example of human creativity that God empowered in the book of Exodus, chapter 35. Now, I teach that, on the basis of this passage, that um, craftsmanship is a spiritual gift. Though Paul does not include it in his mention of spiritual gifts in the New Testament, notice what it says here in Exodus uh, 35, starting with verse 30. Then Moses said to the Israelites, See, 
The Lord has chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the Spirit of God. Notice that word, or that, that phrase, filled him with the Spirit of God. With skill, ability, and knowledge in all kinds of crafts to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and engage in all kinds of, get this, artistic craftsmanship. And he has given both him and Oholiab, son of Ahismach, of the tribe of Dan, the ability to teach others. He has filled them with skill to do all kinds of work as craftsmen, designers, embroiderers in blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and in fine linen, and weavers, all of them, master craftsmen and designers. And so these two gentlemen led the effort to construct the tabernacle according to God's specifications. So, what did God give them? Skill, ability, knowledge in all kinds of crafts to design and make articles of artistic craftsmanship. That is proof positive that God gives creativity. That God has designed us to be creative people. Not all of us will be crafty, not all of us will be artistic, but we have this desire within us to create. It is godly to create. It is satanic to destroy. And in, in that general sense um, of um, creating and destroying. So Alcorn uses this general theological observation as a jumping off point for exercising his spiritual imagination. So in this chapter, I'm, I'm quoting from Alcorn for the most part and just wondering what you think. Um, so very quickly we'll go through these. Um, Alcorn says, I believe we will see trade and business in heaven, though not all for the same reasons, not for all the same reasons we engage in them now. Well, what do we engage in business and trade for? Sometimes for greed, sometimes for pride, um, but more importantly, we should be doing it for God's glory, to provide sustenance for ourselves and our families, and for the joy of work, the joy of work well done and effort put into a good end. Next quote, technology is a God-given aspect of human capability that enables us to fulfill his command to exercise dominion. I've got to say that was a refreshing and new take for me about technology because we often want to separate science and the Bible so we end up separating faith and technology and I, I think that's a mistake. Alcorn is, is calling us to, to reintegrate these things. Now, you can say it's God-given, and I, I think that, like the spiritual gift of craftsmanship, uh, there is a creativity that is accomplished in technology. And if we didn't have technology, you and I would not be engaged in this study right now, would we? So. God bless the people that invent this technology and the people who use it for his glory. Of course, we know that not all technology is used for God's glory, and we know that not all technology is based on faith. Much of it is based on atheistic assumptions and uh, worldviews. And much of it is produced for the sake of greed or pride, just like any other business or trade. Next quote, remember 
the new earth isn't a return to Eden in the sense of abandoning culture, including inventions, transportation, and technology. It's a resurrected earth with resurrected people who have better brains and will be capable of better inventions. I, I found that quote interesting because I think there are some people in our culture who at least claim to be green and uh, would and profess that they would like to return to uh, um, a simpler, more agrarian kind of lifestyle. However, you rarely find anybody that actually does that. Um, people uh, who in, espouse environmental causes in particular um, seem to want to throw us back to the Stone Age, but they don't live that way. Um, but here I think uh, the, the thing I want to affirm is that uh, we will have unlimited opportunity, we will have unlimited resource in heaven, and when you put all of those things together, uh, it makes sense that we will invent things. And that they will be based on truth and will be used to glorify God. Final quote. Since God will resurrect the old earth and the old Jerusalem, transforming them both into new, shouldn't we understand new heavens as an expression of his intention to resurrect galaxies, nebula, stars, planets, and moons in a form as close to their original form as the earth will be <coughs> to its original form, and we will be to ours. Now this is a broad assumption that Alcorn makes in his book, but he makes it for biblical reasons. When it comes time to describe heaven, when it comes time to describe the new heavens and the new earth, what do the Bible reader, writers excuse me, use as metaphor? They use what is around us, what we can see, hear, taste, touch. All of these things that are real to us in this moment are used as a figure of speech or as a point of comparison to what God has in heaven now and what he will provide for us in the new heaven and the new earth to come. So I agree with um, Alcorn's description. Uh, he will then go on flights of fancy and, and say that uh, you know we're going to build spaceships and we're going to travel to other galaxies and maybe we'll discover other uh, species uh, that have had a similar experience uh, of God and all of this stuff. I, I really don't know, that sounds exciting, but there, that's really so far outside of what Scripture teaches that um, I think that's like 95% imagination and maybe 5% Scripture. But be that as it may, I think we can answer this question about designing crafts, technology, and new modes of travel as being entirely possible, indeed even probable in the new heaven and the new earth. I, I think we need to really use this word when we think of heaven. And this word is dynamic. It is not static. It will not be the same over and over and over and over again. That kind of stuff happens in this life and we hate it. Why would God offer us that kind of an existence as a reward? I don't see that as even being possible. But instead, God is giving us a new existence. It is perfected, it will stay perfected, and it will be an existence of unlimited potential. Unlimited time, unlimited opportunity, unlimited partnerships. Given that, I think we should be very excited about the dynamic situation that heaven presents to us. I want to thank you for giving me some extra time today. When we get together next time, we will conclude this study of heaven. Uh, I have uh, received some input about what to do next, 
and that is to tackle the Psalms. Um, and I've been giving that a lot of thought and prayer. If you have other suggestions of things that you would like to study, uh, that you would like to continue with, um, what I'd like to do is, is conclude this at the beginning of September, take the remainder of the month to get something new up and out to you, and um, see what God will do as we continue to meet online to do these Bible studies. But I, I certainly am interested in hearing from you about what you are interested in, what you think or feel like God is leading us to do. How can we best follow up on this study of heaven? That will be the subject of our next gathering. Until then, God keep you in his hand.